Wagner's a different kind of man. <laughs> He's been called the Freud before Freud. As I said earlier, art doesn't have any answers. I'm speaking a little louder because if people would be complaining, they couldn't hear me. Art doesn't have any answers. It only asks questions. And most art, most art, acts upon the assumption that man is a spiritual being. And if we ask the right questions, then the people will listen to those questions and ponder them. That people will be driven back to the center of their being, and there they will find out how to be artists in the art of living. Wagner decided that he was going to ask a whole lot of different questions. He embraced the, of course, as you know, the philosophy of Schopenhauer that superior minds, superior human beings, could set a whole new code of moral behavior because they were above the ordinary, ordinary mortals. Will Durant, in his History of Civilization, points out that there was no advancement whatsoever <clears throat> in the whole development of man until the concept of monogamy took hold. Wagner decided to challenge all kinds of things. He was going to put bastardy, free love, incest, infidelity in marriage. He was going to put these all on the level of mere taboos. And that his, that is Wagner's concept of love, would bring about a better age. Of course, the whole thing went up in smoke. <laughs> and he's got a lot to answer for. Because I believe, I believe that the rise of the Third Reich had a lot to do with Mr. Wagner. Anyway, he was a great genius, an unbelievable genius. And what he used his genius for was what he used it for. But he has influenced all of succeeding musical composition. <laughs> and maybe he influenced the rival in the world of Mr. Freud who has wreaked a lot of havoc also. <laughs> anyway, he was a genius. At the opening of the Valkyrie, you hear a man running through a storm, and he bursts into a, car, a home and falls exhausted. A beautiful, beautiful blog brings him some water. and, later, a cup of mead. They fall instantly in love. Instantly. She is married to his arch enemy. At least that group of people who were the absolute enemies of Siegmund. And Siegmund has just come from a battle where he, he, he slaughtered a bunch of them. He was in a predicament. He'd fallen in love with this man's wife, and she with him. He's in the enem enemy's house. The enemy had told him that uh, you can, the, the, the custom demands that I give you hospitality for the night but in the morning you'll pay for it with your life. Siegmund 
left alone on stage, tries to recall something. And out of his mind, out of his memory, distant memory, he pulls out this remembrance of something that was promised to him by his father, that in his greatest hour of need, he would find an invincible sword. And there's a quite a mu musical interlude that, that introduces that, this, this whole idea and, and of Siegmund struggling to get this answer, which we won't play all, but just part of it. And then he sings the famous Ein Schwert aria, where he thinks he sees it sticking out of a trunk of a tree, doesn't go and examine it very care carefully, but finally concludes that it's just the dying reflection of the embers of the fire. And that's as far as we'll go right now. Okay, we'll try and sing Ein Schwert. 